don't have to have notes of some kind just to keep me on track. I'm Beth Tidd, and I'm so glad to be here, and I'm glad you're here. I bet all of you had a million things you could have done this afternoon besides be here, so I'm glad that you're here. I love teaching. It's my passion. I teach nursing at the College of Nursing. I've been a nurse for 30 years. I've been teaching for 15 now. And I've got to say that uh, when I made the transition from caring for patients to uh, teaching students, that was a real difference for me, but I love teaching. It is what gets me up in the morning, and even on a bad day, I still feel energized. When I was in administration, it did not work that way. Um, I was worn out, tired, exhausted, and miserable. So I'm so glad to be teaching, and I enjoy what I do. What they asked us to do was, was talk about establishing a relationship, and I just always kind of have minutes, and I won't bore you with the detail, but one time I spoke in front of people and didn't have minutes and the only thing I could think about is I'm going to pass out and my students are going to try to do CPR and I'm not there yet and they're going to kill me. So I, I don't want that to ever happen so I always have something to kind of keep me um, on track. Now I am the OCD medical surgical uh, nursing instructor so I'm very like this. My students will tell you I'm very like this. I'm not the, I'm sure the music person is going to be a, a lot, uh, a very different personality than perhaps mine. So I come from a different mindset. So when they ask about establishing relationships in the classroom, I thought, um, you know, how do we do that? And I really do get along with my students very well. But the primary reason is because what causes, what, what do you think can cause a relationship to be derailed? Lack of communication. Lack of communication. Mistrust. Mistrust. Conflict and drama, right? So I'm going to start with the two things that I try to do that keeps the conflict and drama down. Has everybody had a conflict with a student at this point? Have you all been involved in student drama? Okay. All right. And, and again, I know that, that since I don't know the personal story of everybody here, I don't know if you came from business and didn't have education classes. Um, or you have, you know, 50 hours in education classes and you know more than I do. So it's kind of like a box of chocolates. If you want the little creamy center, you take that. If you want the one the nuts, you take that. If you want the surprise foil one, you take that. So whatever you can use, I hope I say something that is, is, is worth you being here on a Friday afternoon. And perhaps if not, my two colleagues will certainly um, help with that. So I start out with the two things that I think really help me set the relationship and build a relationship with my students is, believe it or not, the syllabus and classroom management. I really go back to that because, you know, when you think about it, um, we post our syllabus before the students ever meet us. So their first introduction to who I am is my syllabus. And so what does my syllabus say about who I am? So when we look at our syllabus, and I know USM has a template, but I've been on the GECAC uh, committee now, and I've looked at a lot of syllabi as people submit those, and they're very different across campus, across um, colleges, and among schools. So I, I find that to be very interesting, and I'm like, oh, I need to add this, or oh, okay, that's different, I like that. So I, I get a lot of information from that, but typically what I do, and in, in the context of most relationships, it helps if we kind of know what the context is. What is our relationship going to be? You know, it never works if you're in love with somebody and they only like you, right? It doesn't work if you want to get married and that's not their idea. So and I'm just kind of bringing this all into relationships. So are we in the right relationship? Do we understand? So what I do is I set forth expectations so that everybody knows what their role in this relationship is. And so I do students' um, expectations and I do faculty expectations. So for my students, we, we really spell out a lot because we're a professional school. And that's where I'm going to be a little different because I teach primarily juniors and seniors. I don't teach the freshmen. I don't teach 300 students at a time. I'm teaching students who, who come to a professional school and we, it's a little bit different. So again, this may not fit for everybody. But we really do go through the parameters. We, they get the basics, how to get me, where to find me, what my numbers are, how to email me, and those kind of things. But we also set forth the behaviors that we expect out of our students. And it's not just we expect you to be civil. We kind of spell it out. I, I go through and give them concrete examples of behavior that's not acceptable within our classroom. We do use USM's new policy about incivility and civility. Um, a lot of students don't know if you go <sighs> every time you say something or, you know, they're rolling their eyes or they're talking. 
I mean, how many of you are so distracted when there's 50 conversations going on and you're really trying to communicate? It's very distracting. And it's distracting to those who really did show up to learn. So um, we really talk about those are not behaviors that are tolerated. Um, we tell them that they are to show up for class. We tell them they are to be prepared for class. We tell them you have to read before you come. I mean, all of this is literally spelled out in the syllabus. It says you will have to do X, Y, and Z in order to be prepared. We also give them a timeline. We do a syllabus and then I do a course calendar. And I'm sure a lot of you do this, but it is very detailed, it's very specific. I tell them what their readings are, I tell them who is the lecturer for the day because we have integrated, I have more than just me teaching, so that they know it's going to be either the adult or the pediatric instructor, they kind of know how to prepare mentally because we are different instructors and we do things differently. So we, so we really give them those parameters. I also lay out um, all of their exam dates. We lay out, they have to do a remediation, that's an additional test, which they're not graded on, but the remediation is, a, is something they have to do, and if they don't complete the remediation, they get an I, which will turn to an F if they don't ever complete it. That date is set for the first day, so they really want to know these times and parameters. Now, the problem with that is they don't want it to change later, but I'll talk about that later. But we really spell out the behavior in class, and we tell them, if you have a phone on, during, during a test, you will receive a zero. If I don't care if it wasn't on, I don't care if it never came out, if I see a phone in your person, you will get a zero. So we're very specific with our expectations. We're very specific with you must be on time. Now again, these are nurses and you don't want your nurse late to come take care of you because then you may die. So we really, and seriously, because if they're late for a report, somebody's not taking care of six patients. So um, we really, pay attention to those kind of things and we spell all that out in the syllabus and we go over the syllabus and I know all of you do that as well but we really really go in detail about the expectations and then I tell them what I expect for myself so that they know that I am going to be prepared and I, and I talk to them about that a big piece that I put there because in terms of relationships is building that respect I tell them up front that I never wake up and say how can I humiliate how can I um, disrespect make fun of, talk condescendingly to a student. I know that perhaps they perceive that professors do that, but that's really not what I ever want to do. And then if I ever come across that way, I mean, have you ever like said something kind of you thought was funny, but nobody else kind of thought it was funny? Okay, or you thought it was, you know, one of those kind of cute comments and it came off really, really wrong? Okay, so I tell them that. I said, you know, I'm not human. If I say something that you perceive as me disrespecting you in any way, please come see me. I would never want you to feel that way and let's talk about it. And I've actually had that happen on occasion where students were sensitive to something that I said and they approached me after class and I was able to explain kind of where I was coming from and sometimes there really is no explanation. It was just one of those off the cuff, guess what, I didn't think before I spoke kind of moments. And I'm able to apologize and we're able to, to build on that. So I think that's really important. But we're really laying the groundwork for our relationship, right? We're beginning to say, okay, this is what you're going to do and this is what I'm going to do. And so I think that really helps when we do that. One of the things about my expectations is my availability. Students really need to know when I'm available. I know for um, us, we kind of know when their classes are. My office hours, what I would like to have, are not conducive at all to my students. So I actually put what is more convenient for them than what is convenient for me on my office hours so that I am available to meet them. And you know what, they notice that. And if I have to meet someone out of even that, like they have to email me, they're like, Dr. Chen, I, there's nothing on your sign-up sheet that I can come to, will you please meet with me? I can't tell you the relationships that that builds, but not only does it build it with that person, but you know students are never quiet. They never just have anything happen to them. They tell everybody. So then other students then know that you are willing to meet with them. Now, if I had 300 history students that I was trying to do that for, that would be very different. I probably have about 80 that I would have to try to, um, to meet with, but most of them can meet within the hours. It's just the, the off hours. So again, it's the expectations for me. I do tell them about the parameters. Timing is everything. They want to know when, how, where. We tell them how to turn things in. We tell them what we expect. They know day one when something is due. And I'm sure all of you put that on your calendar, but how many of your students don't pull the syllabus back out? Let me tell you, I can tell you if you're teaching some of the gen ed, because when they're coming over to be, uh, in our, when we're advising, I say, well, tell me how you're doing. Oh, I've got an A. 
and we pull up interim grades, guess what they have? <laughs> an F. And I'll say, um, how do you have an F? I mean, how do you think you have an A and how do they think you have an F? Can you explain that? Um, well, you know, I've passed, I uh, failed three tests, but on this, I've got, I'm going to make an A. Okay. I, I'm, I'm giving you a serious conversation. And, and the young lady was just as sincere as she could be. And I said, really? I said, and how is that going to work? And she said, well, I'm, I'm going to make an A on the last test. Okay. So I said, how much does everything weigh? So she pulls it up on her phone. She hadn't looked at her syllabus since day one. That, that, is, that is one of the students. And we tell them, do not look at this on day one and never look at it again. You need to keep this out. You need to keep this out and keep referring to it. But she literally had no idea that mathematically there was no way she could pass it. I mean, she would have had to make more than 100 to, to pass, not let alone make an A. But she really hadn't paid attention to those kind of things. So um, for them, timing is everything. Again, they want to know when everything is. You know, you know why? Because our students are busier than they've ever been. Have you noticed that more of them are having to work? You know, they, they, they really are. I'm astounded with the responsibility that some of my students have. Like they're working 40 hours, they're coming in, they come and do a test review, well, why do you, you know, tell me why you think what happened, you know, what happened on the test. And they'll say, Dr. Chen, I'll just be honest, I worked 40 hours that week. Worked 40 hours and I know how many hours they were in class. And I know how many hours they were in clinical. I don't know when they slept. So, that, so they really are juggling. So it's really important for us to, to set those times and not change them so that they can plan and do time management. Um, they really want to know how they get their grade. So of course I'm sure everybody puts that in there. I know everybody does the teaching methods. But somehow they still don't understand that. And mine, for a long time, couldn't calculate it. Like they knew what their grades were because we put them on Blackboard. Every time they take a test, their grade goes up so they'll know. But they, couldn't, they didn't know how to calculate it. So they had no idea where they were standing. So we had to take time to do that. That's one of the other things I do on that first day. How many of you use Blackboard Collaborate? Anybody in here use that? I use it a lot. That's the um, where you can record your lectures. And um, we, when we do tests, we know that they're um, dead after a test, but we still have lecture time associated with their course, especially because I teach a five-hour course. So what we do is we collaborate. So they do the test, and then they just go away. They, they can go home, and they can listen to this lecture whenever they want to. And um, what I found out, though, is when they were coming in second semester, they weren't listening to them. Well, why? Well, I've gone on there, and I can't figure it out. I can't find it out. I can't figure out how to get to collaborate. There's two tabs, and you would think I explain it. But I actually pull it up now, and I show it to them. I actually walk it through them so they'll know how to get their lectures. So again, I'm just trying to help them um, know what it is. And you know what that shows them when I'm, when I'm taking the time to do that? That I care about them. Because isn't that another piece in relationship is that you want to know that you're cared about? I mean, you don't want to be in a relationship with someone that doesn't care about you, even if it's just a friendship. Even if it's a professional relationship, wouldn't all of you like to know that your bosses at least respect you? You know, or have some, some mode of caring a positive way um, in terms of, I think about that with our students. That's another reason why I put resources on there, all kind of resources. Ours is not a writing intensive course, but I still let them know where the writing center is. Because even if it's not for my class, it could be for somebody else. I make sure they know where the math zone is. I make sure they know where the learning enhancement center is. I give them Tony's name and say, okay, it's you need to know your pers learning personality. I really take a lot of time with my students, and I think time matters, and time shows that I care. And that's, that's I think, really important for them. Then that's pretty much in the syllabus. I, we just spell it out. But I hope that I'm building a framework. I'm hoping that they'll see that I am caring and that I'm trustworthy because I have what I'm going to do and then I do it. And that was when I get into classroom management, how many of your mothers or people that you know said to you, say what you mean and mean what you say? Oh, cliche. But if I do that, it really makes a difference in my relationships with my students. If they can trust that what I say I'm going to do, I'm going to do. That's also being faithful to, to, to the relationship. I'll give you an example. We had students that were perpetually wanting to be late. It's very disruptive when, you, when you're in the groove, you're getting everybody going, and here comes five students wandering in late, and they never choose the back door, right? Like they walk right in front of you, they're not quiet, they're unloading everything, and you're thinking, can you, can you just at least do it quietly? So we, um, we started having quizzes at the beginning of class, and they had to be in their seat, feet under, ready to go at 8 o'clock. Not, I'm wandering in, I'm finishing up my Starbucks, I'm finishing my grits in the hall, they had to be in the thing. So I said, if you're not in here at 8, you can't take the quiz. 
So that I told him first day of class, told him the next time, and then it came time for one of the quizzes. And so 8 o'clock, I went shut all the doors, started passing out the quiz. Students started popping their heads in, trying to walk. I said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to wait outside. <clears throat> okay, really, I know. I said, no, no, I really, I'm really going to need you to wait outside. And of course, come, a couple of them stomped out, a couple of them, you know, they were, <laughs> they knew. I mean, they knew they were late. So after we took the quiz, um, I let them back in. But the thing was, the students that were in the classroom on time and ready to take the quiz, what do you think their response to that was? <laughs> yes, they were, they, they were, they were going, yay, yay, somebody's finally holding these students accountable. Someone's finally doing what they said they were going to do, so they'll quit disrupting me while I'm trying to learn. So um, it really meant a lot to me. I was talking to my students this morning because they were at the convention because the nurses, the student nurses convention is the same time that the nurses convention is. And they were there, and they were saying that. They said, you were so hard, and da-da-da, da-da-da. They said, but what we really liked is you did what you said you were going to do. And they, they, that's the example they gave, is that I, if I said I was going to shut the door, I shut the door. If I said I was going to do this, I was going to do it. And that really builds trust in that relationship because they can believe me. And when things get crazier or if things get messy, they can at least still believe and trust that I am going to be there and do what I say I'm going to do. I do allow students flexibility within a framework, which sounds kind of strange, like a, like a circle and a square hole. But I do try to allow them some autonomy in the classroom. When we're doing active learning, do you like this or do you like this? Do you want to do it this way or do you want to do it that way? I mean, we do have concepts we have to cover, but I can control that. But I really want to hear what they have to say. And again, then they feel respected. If I'm listening to what they have to say about the way that they perhaps want to learn, it's, it's beneficial. So I give them some flexibility in that framework in my classroom management. I also ask for their input. I do formative along the way. I don't, there's somebody here that does a lot of little mini quizzes about that. I, I'm a little bit more informal than that. I'm just kind of asking them as we go. Tell me how many of you enjoyed what we did today? How many of you didn't? And you know what? They really will respond to me because we've built that relationship and that trust. So I'm glad for that. Um, okay, this is two more important things. Well, one last important thing. And that is, again, when we put that schedule up, I have learned that I stick to that schedule unless an act of God changes it. Katrina, a tornado, or a flood. But otherwise, students, I don't know about, maybe your students don't, but our students are just freaked out if something changes, if you have to change a date, if you have to move something, you have to cancel class. And one of them even said to me, they said, you know, Dr. Trina, I don't know why I'm that way, but it really does unnerve me when things change a lot and I don't have any control over it. So I'm real funny about that, and I know like we had that tornado and we had to miss, but I got us right back on track, on the schedule, they knew from day one, and they seem to be very comforted by that. Now you can see that I'm kind of OCD and kind of like this, so this may not work for everybody, but they just asked me to talk about building relationships with my students, and that was a real important thing, and then I'll finish up, because I have no idea how long I've been talking. I'm okay? All right. No, you're way over. Oh, am I really? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Transparency. I think is the most important thing is letting the students know who you are and um, that you're human. I'm also transparent about how I do test analysis. I'm transparent. I mean, there's I don't keep many secrets. There's not a whole lot of secrets that have to be kept. A lot of people, when they do testing, they won't discuss test analysis. They won't discuss other things. I always do. I explain to them how I do test analysis, how I decide if a test needs to be null or um, a question needs to be null or voided. Um, and I, I go through all that with them. It's a little messy, it's a little lengthy, but I really think it builds relationships. And so that's what I will end on. I'm so sorry. No worries. Thanks. I was afraid I wasn't going to have enough to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mandy Reese, I teach in the history department uh, when Jennifer, and, and by the way, I always fall behind in my class, Lord of mercy. If I ever had a day where I didn't change my syllabus, I wasn't sure what I'd do. <laughs> um, so a bit of a different uh, uh, viewpoint on kind of the same questions. When Jennifer asked me what to talk about about building a relationship with students. I had no idea that I'd ever built any relationship with students. So I had to sit around and think about it. Um, I've been teaching, uh, then I realized I've been teaching here for 27 years and that after I got, I needed a shot of bourbon to get over that thought in and of itself. But then when I moved on, began to think about some of the things I perhaps uh, had gleaned from those uh, 27 years. Um, I began to realize in my own teaching there that there's simply no sim single way to do it. At the furthest end of my teaching, I teach single doctoral students who are writing their dissertation. Um, then there's, of course, doctoral level classes where there's 10 or 15 of them, maybe six or seven. Uh, then uh, uh, there's 
at least for me, there's 30 or 40 student classes at the upper level of, of undergraduate. I uh, also take students overseas where it's an entirely different experience where there's 12 of you hanging around on a beach in Normandy and then there's 300 student gigantic monster sections uh, of history and they're, and they're all a little bit different how you reach students but I do think that there are some commonalities uh, between them and I, and, I, and I certainly think it starts off on day one as, as we just heard. Now, my first couple of years I didn't have a syllabus because I hated them. Uh, I thought the syllabi were, were the, the work of the devil because it I felt it constrained me uh, where I wanted to be, teach wild and free and you know wear no shoes and stuff like that. Uh, I wouldn't have worn no shoes. That would have been very bad at relationship building had I worn no shoes. But but as time as time has gone on, I realized that you you really do need to constrain yourself a little more as the uh, uh, abilities of students have changed as well, and they're perhaps less self-reliant than they used to be. Uh, you really need to. You really need to spell things out. And my syllabus now is, you know, seven or eight pages, and it spells out everything that they need to do, all the punishments that might go along with it. But I think when we're going over that syllabus in that first day of class, uh, probably the most important thing I do is be really upfront with them about my expectations. And I was going to specifically talk about the 300 freshmen, because I do think that's the hardest class uh, where there's a, a problem of making relationships with students. There's a problem in knowing who the hell they are and much of building a relationship with them. In that class, probably the most direct thing I do, I try to make that syllabus be direct. Um, I t and it's their first semester in college, most of them too at this point. Uh, I tell them straight up that history is one of those widely failed classes. If you've ever heard of those, you prep teach a widely failed class. And I define a widely failed class as at least hereditarily, it goes up and down. But at least 20% of them are going to fail. Period. I tell them that up front. 20% of y'all are going to fail. And then I break it down and say, because, and this is the way I've kind of figured it out over time, I tell them 10% of them are too damn stupid to be in there. <laughs> um, then we get into defining stupid. Okay, we, uh, for, for first off, I, we, we deal with this for a long time. I say, don't let anybody ever call you stupid. I mean, don't take that off me, don't take it off anybody. You're probably unprepared, perhaps you went to a high school that didn't challenge you, perhaps your teacher was a coach and didn't know what the heck he was doing about teaching. But there are some students who just aren't quite ready to be here. And, and those students are the students I feel sorry for uh, when I see their name pop up. Um, then I tell them 10% of them are too damn drunk to pass my class. Uh, they, they come to college and they get in, and everybody ought to do this. Uh, everybody ought to come to college and Enjoy the social part. Come on, this is the four years you're not somebody's kid or fixing to be somebody's parent, right? So, so this is the four years you kind of get to be you. And some students sadly get lost in that. So, so I mean, I try to hit the nail right on the head and show them, you know, first off, you know, the, 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 really make it clear that a whole bunch of them are going to fail unless they, you know, fight against the social aspect of it and fight against their own, you know, perhaps lack of a background. Um, and, and then I like to get in the fact that you know, I have a little different uh, experience than most folks. I went to school at Southern Miss a long, long, long time ago. I had a nice mullet. I, looked like, <laughs> I was trying hard to look like Duran Duran uh, back then. But I sat in the exact same classroom they did, and I was indeed drunk and stupid. There's no doubt about that. But I had teachers who rescued me for, from, from that. Teachers who you know, inspired me to be something more than a pizza delivery driver. And, and I think it's that, it's that first day when you can really, you know, it, it's laws and, you know, things they need to do and, and all the, you know, horrible boringness of a first day of a syllabus. But it's that first day. If you don't reach them on that first day uh, to, and make some kind of connection, make yourself human, as we heard of before. you got to make yourself human. Uh, to these people, even to the point of self-deprecation. In fact, that's a very easy way to do it in front of 300 people, is to be, is to be self-deprecating. Then suddenly you become the professor that they want to come talk, talk to. And, and so many of them have nobody to talk to. Uh, nobody to talk to of any intellectual rigor, at least. They have friends and pals and, you know, their mom in the trailer and stuff like that, but that they don't have anybody they can talk to on the same kind of level that's what they need. So I think you need to make that relationship on the first day. 
And it's all about gaining their respect. Even if you're self-deprecating and dropping your INGs and attempting to uh, <laughs> to uh, to reach them on, on something more like their own level. And, and again, I think in that 300 student class, it's the hardest part of it because in a in a graduate class or upper level undergraduate class, uh, the students know why they're there. They're they're in that class because they respect us. They're in that class because they're aware that you've written a book or that they understand the the number of degrees you have or the performance art that you've been able to accomplish. That they know that, so so they come in with that respect. For those 300 students, though, you're the enemy behind a podium. Uh, you, uh, you're the person that stands between them and the GPA for them to become a nursing student, right? And, and you need to make that you need to make that leap. So I do think uh, that's a, a, a difficult um, a hurdle for you to jump over. Um, not everybody can do the second part, but they can do aspects of it. Um, teaching, especially to those big groups, but even in small groups, perhaps less so on a dissertation level, but even there's even some of this there. Teaching is a performance art, um, both in how you craft what you're going to say and the manner in which you actually perform it and, and say it. Um, we're actors, especially in front of a giant class of students who'd rather be somewhere else. You've got to find some way to keep them awake. And a sleep student will make you mad and they ain't going to learn nothing uh, during your class. Um, I've seen, you've all seen them too, you all went to college, you've all seen sullen, cantankerous, angry teachers who think students are beneath them. Uh, and perhaps they are, but you certainly don't want to act like it. Right, that's a little self-defeating. Those sullen, cantankerous, angry teachers equal sullen, cantankerous, angry students. And, and that gets you off to a really, you have a relationship, you sure as hell have a relationship, but it's an adversarial one and not, not a very healthy one. Uh, so, as, as she was saying, I mean, um, uh, my teaching days are my fun days. Even if I'm not feeling well, I'm going to go teach and, and feel good on, on that day. Um, I got into this thing because I loved history. I didn't get into this thing because it got me a fine car. There's no doubt about that. Go look at my car. I didn't get into this thing for fame or beautiful women or none of that kind of stuff. I got in, and you didn't either. You got into it because you loved playing the flute or loved taking students on, you know, wonderful excursions or, or whatever. Whatever, you know, <coughs> kept you awake when you were a, a high school senior or an undergraduate in college. Um, when I teach, we, we have a, a graduate teaching practical when we're, because we used to, we used to just throw anybody in that was in graduate school into teaching classes for us. Then we realized, God, they're terrible at it because nobody's ever talked to them about how to teach. So we developed a long time ago a graduate teaching practicum. And what they always ask me to come in and talk about in that practicum is to kind of, you know, kind of fire them up to kind of the why are you here to do this in the first place aspect of it. And you do it because you love it. You may have forgotten it over the years, but, but you do it because you love it. And I tell them, teach it like you love it. And if you teach it like you love it, if you teach it with the same enthusiasm that kept you going through a billion years of graduate school, uh, that enthusiasm will, will, will come out. Um, again, teaching it like you love it, I think, is, is the key thing. How fun is that? I, I love history. And in front of me are 300 students who hate it, who just loathe it. And they probably loathe it because they were taught poorly. And I have a captive audience to whom I can just let my nerdiness run free. You know, it's like being the owner of a comic book store. You know, you get to do anything you want to. It's nerd heaven to actually have the chance to take people who dislike or don't know your subject area and to spend. They have to sit, they have to listen. They have to pretend like they care. And how fun is this? I mean, that is really a fun thing to do. And if you attack your craft like that, then that kind of infectious, if you're up there having a good time, the students are having a good time, or at least a better time. Perhaps they'll never have a great time with history, but a better time than they would have otherwise. If you're up there with a grin on your face, they're probably up there with a grin on their face. If you're awake and enjoying it, they're probably awake and enjoying it too. And, and actually, this comes to graduate school as well. Uh, this comes to those much more difficult, much more focused upper-level classes because 
sometimes we have an easier time reaching freshmen all the way at one end and graduate students at the other end, actually people who are wanting to be like us, we actually have a bit of a more of a disconnect with. And those people are going through a fire. I mean, those people are going through smaller and smaller flaming hoops. And at the end of those flaming hoops, they may still, you know, work offshore on an oil rig, right? These people are brave. And, and, and they're also, you know, staring into lights like a deer, right? Because this is a very difficult thing for them. They may seem more adult. They may seem more into it. They may seem more self-reliant. But if you get down beneath that, they're probably more frightened than the freshmen are because they, they're, they're really about to jump off a off a, a high dive and they're wondering whether there's any water in the pool. So it's that level of humanity, that level of compassion, and that level of just reminding them that they love it. Just reminding them, you know, 10 years into the discipline that they got here for a reason. That, that actually helps graduate students more than you would think. Um, so that's kind of all I had to say was that um, the dynamic of mutual respect is an earned thing and I think showmanship doesn't hurt and a love for your craft uh, can make all the difference. Thanks a lot. I'm a music education professor in the School of Music, uh, which means my life has been very twofold. I've spent, mo I, this is my 27th year teaching. When I say that, it's like frightening. Uh, most people that went through undergrad with me uh, are calling now and saying, hey, I'm gonna retire in a year or two. And I'm like, wait, how is that possible? Well, what happened is I decided to go to grad school twice, like most of you. So that's delayed that part of it. So I've been a band director, choir director, orchestra director, French horn teacher a lot of my life, but always fascinated with the art of teaching and decided to get my terminal degree, uh, my PhD in music education. And uh, a lot of people think that I get to conduct now and I don't, which I hate that. Uh, some people think I play the piano all the time, which I don't, and I hate that. But I talk to people and teach people how to teach, and specifically how to teach music. Um, and I'm one of those people, uh, like my colleagues, like Beth and Andy, I'm so in love with the art of teaching that when someone just calls it teaching, I want to correct them and say, can you say the art of teaching? Because it truly is, I believe, I think all of us would agree, an art form. So professor as teacher, I uh, was talking to my parents uh, probably two years ago and talking about professors being educators. And my mom said, well, how many hours of education training is required of all college professors? And I really thought about it in detail. I said, none. And she said, really? I said, really? Unless you're an education professor, or a music ed professor, or a dance ed professor, none. It's very possible. And he's talking about creating this environment where the graduate students are getting teacher training on how to be a teacher. So here's my mom, a fairly intelligent person, that it, it just, she always assumed that we've all had all this training. So it's very possible that. There's somebody on this campus that's been teaching as long as I have and have had no teacher training. It's just all been by watching Andy teach and going, I probably should do that. I probably should be that animated. I don't know if I can be, but I'll stand here and I'll do this at least. And maybe it will help, Andy. I'm going to borrow that one. Pound on the podium more. Right, them up. I think most people think these three things of college professors. We've finished K-12, through graduate degree. We were academically successful. There are exceptions of all these things, yes? One of my heroes dropped out of high school in ninth grade, got his GED, now has his PhD, is teaching at the University of Tennessee. Um, amazing. If, I, if someone asked me for a short description, we are content experts. We are content experts. Susan, right? Yes. Susan, you're a content expert at what? Math. Math. I'm um, not sure I claim that, but I'll take it. Awesome. <laughs> ben, Ben, is ben. much more so. Yeah? Your mathematics? No, Physics? No, math. We take him. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> My friend Elizabeth is a uh, piano pedagogue. Um, Elizabeth and I teach together. Good to see you. Uh, I, I think my content mastery is in music. But I don't do piano as well as Lips does, does piano. I don't teach music theory as well. I certainly don't play flute very well. I can play the flute. You don't want to hear it. Well, I can play a few notes that you want to hear, but not many. So I think this is what we all are. We all come here as content experts, and we should be. 
Uh, I wanted to go just to, to look this up, and so I'm paraphrasing what many, many, many uh, hits on Google said when, when I looked up, well, how do I become a college professor? Some of them were quite funny. And even the statement uh, highly offends me. I'll let you read it for yourself. You have five more seconds. Three. Read faster. Two. One. Uh, killing jo uh, Jeff Foxworthy a little bit. So, you might be a college professor if you... <laughs> I mean, I'm wearing glasses. Certainly like everybody down here is wearing glasses. Contacts. <laughs> mine is the latter. I don't know about yours, but mine is the latter. I want fail now. I didn't know that was necessary. So, we're stereotyped. These are stereotyped things about professors and what we do. So, if I'm going to self identify, I identify myself as an expert in the art of teaching. And I think I'm all of these things. I am a content ex expert. I think to be a great teacher, you have to observe. If you continue to learn, all these things we know, we hear about. Herder, I thought about this uh, a couple weeks ago. The largest group I've ever had to herd together and get to do something at the same time was about five, uh, 1,500 students. When I was teaching at the University of Eastern Michigan. We did a recruiting thing where we asked high school bands to come and perform with a college band. And they all sit up in the stands, and you grab the mic, and you say, Central High School, please come on the field now. And we organized graduate students to put them on the field in the right place. And um, I was a herder. <laughs> so a lot of us are on the same page here. We have to be all those things. <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing about snake oil salesmen. I think, though, we're really not selling snake oil. Hopefully, we love math. We love physics, we love polymer science, we love kinesiology, we love dance, we love history. And so it's really not that, but I think we have to be animated. I think we have to offer our subject matter in that way. When asked to do this, uh, Jennifer, thank you so much and everyone was part of, of asking me. These are some things that I teach my students that take many, many people from being a good teacher to being a pretty effective teacher. Whether your grades, your students' grades go up or not, I don't know if I can show that research, but I can show that they'll remember more things, they'll care more, they might take your second history class. If you use your teacher voice, which is volume, speaking more slowly, varying the inflection of your what? Voice. I think gesture is a part of being an effective teacher. If you stand behind the lecture, lectern and you get great results, awesome. I have to walk around. One, that's my personality. Two, I drink too much coffee. I also think, what's your name? Matt. Matt. Hi, Matt. So I notice Matt every day. I'm teaching a class of 300 people, and he often falls asleep. So, and this is where he always sits. It's like the, we were talking about earlier in, in church. Someone sits in your pew, and you walk up, and you're looking at them. Jesus loves you, but get out of my pew. That's mine. So I, I, I would go in, and uh, when I taught large classes at Ole Miss, I would put caution tape right here. And I knew Matt would walk down and go. <laughs> and either sit here or there. And I, I would try to catch him and go, no, no, it's okay. Uh, I'll take the tape off. Go ahead and sit down. But you have to leave that one empty. And about five minutes into the class, what would I do? I would start lecturing from right here. About the time that Matt normally falls asleep. Oh. What's your name? Matt. Awesome. <laughs> I don't want lecture from here. I think getting, uh, getting around the room at least works for me and works for me well, whether I'm teaching a huge class or not. I'm a big believer in this one, reading to students only when necessary. <laughs> I had students in my office today complaining about a class they all have to take outside of the School of Music. I said, well, what can I do to help you enjoy that class more? <clears throat> and I said, well, the teacher reads from the book or reads from the PowerPoint and that's it. I said, okay, as a teacher of teachers, let's analyze that. Is that teacher necessary? If you read to them out of the book and you read a PowerPoint, to them, you are no longer necessary. That sounds really blunt and really cold, but I don't want my students to do that with their own music students, and certainly not the graduate students that we're preparing to be like us. I don't want some of our PhD students in our school of music 
to make PowerPoints and, and simply speak from that. Now, that said, I want to be realistic. Sometimes in our curriculums, we have to teach them to memorize things. And I tell my students, like I teach a class called uh, Brass Methods. I get all these students that don't play brass instruments, and I have just one semester to teach them to play and teach brass instruments. And Michael Lapinto's office, he's our PR person for the School of Music, is right above the band hall, which is where I teach that class. And I, I know for like eight weeks, it's just horrifying for him. <laughs> the sounds that are coming from that. And I tell them, on the trombone, if I want to play an A flat at the top of the staff, my trombone slide has got to be in third position. And I know that half of them are going to forget that. Why? Because they may not have to teach it for two or three years. There's no context for it. There's no reason to have to know it. So I teach them to memorize all that, but I also teach them how to figure it out on their own. And I hope that when they're standing in front of an orchestra and I'll say, have to remember that, they go, what did he say about A flat? Oh, that was the day he sang the silly song and he went, this is an A. That's a flat A. And I go up to the board and I draw a flat A and I use three things. How many things are up there? Three. Three. Three things. And I talk to them about, you know what? I know you may forget it. It's going to be on the test. You have to get it right to make an A on the test. But I want you to be able to recall it quickly and get back to the information. That's what's important to me. So sometimes I think even when we're just teaching them to memorize stuff, which a lot of us have to do for our curriculum, we explain to them why the memorizing is part of it. And this goes back to a lot of things that Beth said. I think when I teach in that way, when I try to anticipate what they're thinking, it makes me a more effective teacher. I know that that valedictorian is sitting there going, why am I memorizing the periodic table? Why? I will never need it, ever. And you know what? They might be right. But we all know that learning, learning anything about anything is important. Learning about how to memorize is important, because we will need that skill our whole lives. And I would rather practice it in all kinds of fields than not. Beth mentioned some of this stuff earlier. According to research, today, these are the kids we're teaching as a group. If I'm stereotyping them as a group, this is who they are. They're more diverse. They're more in debt than, than my generation. They are now less likely to get a job. I'm afraid we're about to be bombarded in the media that this is no longer necessary for them to get a job, although we've sold that for decades. I fear that. And that confuses them. I also think they're very excited. They're very eager to please. They are less likely to think divergently. I'll say this out loud. I think standardized testing has a lot to do with this. And I'm, I'm afraid that some of them are lazy, egocentric, non-visionary, dishonest. But so were they in 1981 when I went to LSU as an undergrad. So then this is maybe the most important thing I might can offer today, just from my perspective. I don't think we can teach them as groups. I don't think we, we, we can think of them as groups. I don't think we can stereotype them as groups. I think the best way we can reach them is to know who they are as individuals. And even if there's 300 people, maybe I learn the name of the people that are falling asleep in my class first. Or the person that's always late. Or the person that's making D's, yet they're watching me all the time when I teach and they're feverishly writing notes. See, even if there's 300 of them, I may stop the end of my... How are you doing? <laughs> who are you? David. David. So David's the person that writes feverishly makes D's and F's on all my tests, and when I dismiss 300 people, I'm standing here. And I say, David, do you know where my office is? I would love to talk to you. Do you have time to come see me? I want you to do well in my class, and it's not happening right now. What can I do to help you? So I know it's tough in the large classes, but I reach out to those people first, those that I can in the large group identify as maybe <clears throat> someone I can uh, get to. Smaller classes, 25, 35, um, this takes up a lot of time. But I love this. Every student in all my classes get a grade for coming to see me for 15 minutes. So on my door, there's a sign-up sheet that goes up at the beginning of the semester, and everybody has to come see me for 15 minutes, and all we're going to do is talk. What's your favorite food? What's your favorite vacation spot? Do you like, not like USM? Who's your favorite football team? And it's shocking. If I had to stereotype Jennifer, Simply on meeting her, outgoing, you look outgoing, well-dressed, you're well-spoken. Then she comes in my office and in that 15 minutes I realize she's scared to death, not sure what she wants to do for a living, doesn't understand what I'm talking about in the class. I've got to change. I've got to change. Or that person that, that's very, very, very quiet and walks in and never make, every time I look at them, they look away. 
And I sit down with Beth, and she just lights up because I said, what do you want to talk about? I just got a new puppy. And this makes me sound like a high school teacher or a high school counselor or a middle school teacher, but I, the other day I had like eight of these in one day. I didn't teach on that day, and I just had like eight interviews, and I did a bunch of research. I went home, and I was so happy, and I, I was <clears throat> asking myself, why am I so happy? Because I sat down, and I met eight people <coughs> that I know something more about, and I will absolutely change how I address them. The person that seems really shy, that I realize is really shy, I'm going to figure out how to do something just to say hi. Think back to all the teachers you had in your life, those that made a difference. It may have been one word and one sentence one time, yes? So I think building relationships for me really manifests itself in this. I know it's hard to get to know everybody in your class, but if I have a class of 25, I ask them over the course of a whole semester just to come and spend 15 minutes with me, and that causes one of them or two of them to stay in college, or to like my subject better, or to get me better, or me to get them better, I think it's worth it. Now, even though the IHL board is looking at us financially and saying you've got to keep them in, get them, keep them in, graduate them, if you're like me, you fear that it means we have to lower our rigor to do that. But I don't think we have to. I think we have to keep digging in and get to know them as individuals when we can, how we can. That's what I have to offer.